Hello, welcome to Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. What are we going to talk about today? Oh, I know. We're going to look at a new toy. I got this box in. So let's take a look at what is inside this box. I did peek into it earlier just to make sure that it contained what I thought it contained. But I just gave it a little peek. I didn't didn't go any further than that. So let's see. What do we have here? I don't buy many new toys anymore. Hardly any. I'm really not not that into new stuff these days. Well, we got some white tape, whatever that is, lots of paper, oh here we go, uh, more paper, oh look, there's a toy, let's put this over here, the new NECA Munster set. The NECA Remco style Munster set. Let's take a look here. Oh, they're cute. They're cute little guys. And a gal. Okay. Here we have the NECA Remco style Munsters figurines. There's Lily. There's Herman. And there's the Count, also known as Grandpa Munster. But in this movie, he's not Grandpa yet. Okay, well, what's the story on this thing? First of all, these figurines are based on the new Rob Zombie version of the monsters. Rob Zombie, in case you hadn't heard, Rob Zombie has made a new film, a new film adaptation of the monsters. And it's it's on streaming. Um, I watched it on Amazon Prime. I, I don't know what the current uh, where it's currently available to watch, but that's how I watched it. I saw it on Amazon Prime, and it's been out for a couple months now. It was out for the Halloween season, but this just came out, and this is the first merchandising 
I've seen in person for the the Rob Zombie monsters. And as far as toys are concerned, I haven't. This is the first toy I've seen. I understand NECA is working on some articulated figures. I think that's part of their Ultimates line. They're not doing retro cloth Mego style figures, as far as I know. Now there are some custom ones that Brent's Dolls has made, and you've probably seen if you're on social media, you've seen Dan Roebuck promoting those, and and Brent also promoting those so brent's dolls has some custom has a whole line of custom rob zombie monsters figures and billy's i thought he was going to jump up there brent's dolls has a whole line of custom uh rob zombie monsters figures but as far as uh official licensed factory made figures these are these are the first I've seen. And I don't know what else is coming out besides NECA is also making uh, the Ultimates figures. I wish they would make Mego style figures. Brent's Dolls has made Mego style figures. So if that's what you want, it's Brent's Dolls. That's the source to get them. But these are cute too. And they're, they're cuter if you know what they're supposed to be. Obviously, they're the monsters, the new monsters, but why do they look like this? What's the idea here? Of all the ways to present these characters, why do it like this? In 1964, Remco, you know Remco, they made the, uh, the universal monster figures with the arms that hug and, and glow heads and they made the little universal mini monsters at the same time and all kinds of other stuff like Hamilton's invaders and all kinds of great toys over the years but in the 60s they made uh, a series of little little figurines from various properties and one of them was the monsters and this is the original monsters with Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis and Yvonne DiCarlo. In 1964, Remco made these little figurines of the monsters, and they had a jointed necks so the heads could swivel, and they had rooted hair, and I think their heads were squishy, but their bodies were solid. And even though it looked like their arms could move, I don't think they did. I've never owned the Remco 64 monster set. They also made the Adams Family in a similar style. They made all kinds of, of toys in that little big head sort of a style. A big head, with rooted hair, squishy head, but then a small, solid PVC body that didn't move. It was just a static pose. And then you were about so big. They were as big as these. And they came in little window boxes. Now, I've never owned the Remco monsters figures or any of those other any other remco little big head that's not what they were called but uh, the big head style figures that they made i've never owned any of those but a friend of mine named christopher noble has allowed us to show this photo of the monsters toys in his collection so this is christopher noble's remco Monsters figures. These are vintage 1964. And you can see what I'm talking about there. They've got those big heads and those little bodies. And the necks swivel. The, the heads move side to side. And the bodies are solid. They don't move. But what you can't see in that picture are the boxes. Those 60s figures came in boxes that looked just like this except individually sized instead of long horizontal like this they were narrow to uh, j just big enough for one figure because they didn't come all together like this the 60s figures were boxed individually but the design of the box the colors and everything was just like this so this box this NECA box is designed to look like 
the Remco box. So the figures are designed to mimic the 60s Remco figures, and the box is also meant to mimic the Remco figures. And the top of the box looks like a roof because it is a roof. It's like a little haunted house. Uh, we'll take a closer look in a second, but let's just get the take in the whole thing so you get the idea. It's like a house. And the little monsters are peeking through the windows. The original ones in the 60s had shrink wrap. They didn't have a window, a, a plastic window like that. They, it was open and then the whole box was shrink wrapped. And I like how NECA has gone to great lengths to copy the style of those boxes. Not just the toys, but also the packaging. They really nailed it. And I especially like the, the uh, sides. And I wish I had an original box to show you because these, they really captured the look of those 60s boxes. A lot of love obviously went into this toy. Some people say she looks like Michael Jackson in that image. And uh, yeah, I would agree in, in, that, in that image the toy does resemble Michael Jackson. But that style of, of how they're presented in these windows like that and the color, I mean, it's dead on, like the 60s boxes. Here, they have the same three characters presented the same way. I, I, I think it's different on the 60s boxes. I, think, I, think, I don't think the sides are identical. They both have the same windows. I don't know if they have the same three characters in the same position like that. So here's the back of the box. And as much as I like the toys, I think this box is what sold me. They just did such a, a good job of capturing the, the feel of that 60s era packaging and that style of toy making back then. And they translated these, these modern iterations of these characters. I mean, yes, they're, they're the monsters, but they're very modern looking in, in the way they're, the character designs are styled, they're very, very modern. And yet, they lend themselves perfectly to this format. And I can just imagine a million ways this could have gone wrong, and this toy w would have just ended up looking stupid. But it looks great, I mean, they really, <laughs> they really came through and made this thing harken back to the 1964 Remco set. And I like the vivid sculpts, particularly, I think Herman really stands out in, in this set, just his expression, his eyes. Um, I, I think they really captured that characterization. Now, as far as the characters in the movie, obviously the, the Count, if you've seen it, Dan Roebuck as the Count steals the film. I mean, he's, he's the main attraction as far as I'm concerned. He's, he's the reason <laughs> He's the reason you, figuratively speaking, you buy your ticket. I mean, it's it's not in a theater; it's on, it's on streaming. But 
uh, he he's the reason to watch the movie. Everyone's good, but he really steals the show. And his figure is fantastic. I mean, it, it in that format, it really captures that character. Now, the Lily figure, I think it, it, it does, it captures, so Dan Roebuck plays the Count. Jeff Daniel Phillips plays Herman Munster. And Sherry Moon Zombie plays Lily Munster. And the, the figure of Lily Munster, I think it captures Sherry Moon Zombie, but um, it, 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 it's a little, oh, there's a little bit of a harshness to it that um, I, I wish it was a little bit softer sculpt. It's a little harsh. She's, she doesn't look that, I don't know how to describe it, that harsh in the movie. She's very beautiful in the movie, and, and this, this sculpt is a little, a little harsh looking. Um, but that's, that, that's fine for the more monstrous characters, Herman and, and the Count. It's, it's difficult to capture female monsters because it's such a delicate balance. They, they you know, like versions of the Bride of Frankenstein are always interesting to compare how they approach that because you want it to look like a monster, but with most female monster characters, there's a beauty there, there's an elegance there, and you have to capture that too. So there's an interesting balance. So it's a little tricky capturing female monsters in a sculpt. As far as the characters are concerned, yeah, my favorites in the movie is my is the Count. He really steals the show. In this set, I think Herman is the centerpiece of the set. I mean, literally, he's in the center. But also, I just think that they really nailed it with that Herman figure and that, that expression, those eyes. But the Count... They did a great job of translating that character into this format, which must have been really, really tricky to make it look vintage, like 1964, and make it and just shrink it down into this kind of distorted format and still keep the characters intact. Now, looking at her on the camera here, she looks really good on camera. So maybe, maybe she, maybe to you watching, she's going to look a lot better than she did to me looking at her with the naked eye. Because she, looking at her right now, she looks great on camera. And very vintage. She definitely has a vintage look. So yeah, like I said, I'm not buying a lot of new toys, but I bought these because I just I saw the previews of these this set, and I just thought, wow, that they really captured the characters, but also that '64 Remco aesthetic. They captured it with the toys and with the packaging, and yet I don't feel like like it's a ripoff of something from the past. Like sometimes with Super 7 lately, I've felt like they're, some of the stuff they've done lately, like the Luminator monsters and some of that, you know, some of it just feels wrong, but not this. And, and you know, NECA doesn't really do a lot of that. They did the, again with Remco, they did the Remco style Universal monsters, the, the big one like Frankenstein, Wolfman, Mummy on, on Remco style cards. And now I'm wondering, do they have some kind of relationship with whatever, if Remco exists as an entity? I don't think it does. Remco is Azraq Hamway International. Does that, I don't know if that company legally still exists. Does NECA have 
some relationship there. I don't know because they they did those mo big monsters on those Remco cards, and now they did this in this Remco box. So they they're really on a a Remco kick, recreating these Remco toys, uh, like updated versions of Remco toys. So I'm wondering if it's just that they're a fan of Remco, or if there's something more going on. They're very charming. I don't know if there's any posability. Like I'm looking at Herman and his arm up like this. I'm wondering if that arm moves. I don't know. The originals didn't move. Let's, let's see what these say here. The Count, obviously, Herman Munster. Munster Monsters, horrifyingly hilarious carbon copies of the monstrously funny Universal Studios movie stars. Great for kids. They're loaded with laughs. Lily Munster. And that language reflects the language that was on the original sides of the original boxes. And then there's some credits on the bottom of the box. Let's hold that up so you can read them if you want. Those are the people who brought you these toys. Well, I thought these were really charming and I'm glad I bought them. I'm not taking them out of the box, no. I think it, I should say a little more about the 60s toys. I was looking at pictures of the boxes, and unfortunately, I don't know anyone who, who I know. I mean, I'm, I'm among the collectors I know. I'm sure there are some that have boxed '60s monsters figures, but I don't know who they are to reach out to them in a timely manner and try to get photos. Uh, I have held in my hand the vintage monsters figures several times over the years. I've had opportunities to buy them. In fact. Uh, earlier this fall, I was considering buying a set just so I could do this episode in a more complete way and show them to you, but um, the price just defeated me. Uh, depending on, I, I've seen all kinds of prices. I've seen them, the original ones, loose between $100 and $300 each, depending on condition or really just depending on the whims of whoever's bidding that day and in boxes they seem to be around a thousand dollars each uh, there was a lily that went for much less but i think that there was there were some issues with that packaging so that maybe that's why she went for less there was a herman that sold just over a thousand in a box and i didn't see a, a grandpa monster uh, in a box that sold recently. There are several in, well, not several, there are some in repro boxes. So if you are if you go to eBay to try to buy the originals, read the descriptions carefully because there are some really, really nice repro boxes out there. And the way some of these things are described, it's kind of tricky. You have to read the descriptions all the way to the end and, and know what you're buying. So look out for that. But, you know, they're expensive. And, and even when I started collecting, they were already expensive. Back in the 90s, they were already expensive. They haven't really gone up very much in value. They've kind of stayed the same for the last 30 years, but they haven't gone down. They've never been affordable. So I probably will never own them. I mean, I like the monsters, but I don't particularly collect monsters. I don't have hardly any monster stuff. I used to have the talking Mattel Herman Munster doll in the 90s. I don't have him now. I would like to get that again. I really like that doll. I want him in a pristine box. I want him in a, not a repro, but a perfect box. Uh, and I want the doll unused. I don't really care so much if it still talks. It, it, it's a pull string. If it's been sitting in that box for 60 years, it probably doesn't talk. That's okay as long as it's not worn out. It's just 
you know, if the internal mechanism just doesn't work anymore, whatever. I'm more concerned with the toy being unused, pristine, beautiful, the box being beautiful. I just want it in perfect, beautiful condition. I'd like to have that talking Herman. That's really the only Munster's toy that I'm really interested in owning someday. I had a rough one in the 90s and sold it. If it had been mint, I probably would not have sold it. I'd like to get a, a minty boxed talking Herman one of these days. Not right now. I, I, you know, I don't have the money for something like that right now, but someday I'd like to have that. But I don't think I'd really need to have a shelf full of Munsters stuff. It's, I like the Munsters, but I'm not, it's not a focus of mine. I don't think I would spend a thousand dollars or more uh, or, or thousands of dollars to get a boxed set of the originals of these. It'd be cool to own, but I don't think I have enough of a passion for it to spend that kind of money. It, I, I, but I was looking at pictures of original boxes and looking at the artwork to compare so I could tell you, well, is this accurate or not? It's very accurate, uh, the way this is styled. But one thing that was interesting on the original boxes, now let's say instead of this wide box, keep in mind they're, they're narrow. They're just, they're sized for one figure. These figures were sold individually in the 60s. Uh, so imagine this box, but small. There's a big hole right here. Uh, well, let, let's say this. Let's say this were the back of the box, just to get the proportions a little closer. Let's say this was the back of the box. This lower half is open. It's shrink wrapped, but if the shrink wrap were not there, it, it would be open. There's a big hole, and in that hole, there's a little white square, and you can see the rubber bands that hold the Remco figures in place. You can see the back of the insert. I don't know why there's the, a big hole like that, but in that hole you can see this white card. That white card is an adhesive label, a double-sided ad adhesive label. And then on the bottom of the box there are instructions telling you what to do with that. And it shows you placing, it shows like an illustration of the Herman figure being placed on this label. And the idea is that you would stick these to your card dashboard. That's what these were really intended for. They were card dashboard toys. And we've talked about that before. There's all this crossover between car culture and hot rod culture and monster culture in the 1960s. So much so is, is that I wonder if the monster craze would have been as popular as it was if not for that crossover with the car culture. I feel like the car culture is part of what made the monster culture cool and legitimized it and kept it going for several years. And I, we've talked about how jigglers, rubber, rubber jigglers, like bugs and spiders and, and monsters and, you know, Ben Cooper, Azurac Hanway, all these different companies that made the rubber jigglers it had the elastic loops coming out of their head. Those were meant to hang from rear view mirrors. The rear view mirror in your, in your car, they were meant to hang off of that, this rubber jiggler. That was the point, really. It wasn't to bounce them around. It was to hang them from your mirror. And the point of these Remco toys, the originals, was to stick them on your dashboard. And, and you'd think they would have like a bobblehead kind of thing if you stuck them to the dashboard, because they kind of lo they look like bobbleheads. You'd think that the head would have moved, but it didn't. It didn't do that. But that was the idea. And on the bottom of the box, it has the instructions to stick it to your dashboard. That was the point. I don't know if they had bobbleheads back then. I don't know anything about bobbleheads. I own very few bobbleheads. Uh, so I don't know if that was a thing like it, like it was in the last 20 years. 
sticking a bobblehead because I know in the modern day people stick bobbleheads in their car so as they drive the head bounces around and these kind of look like bobbleheads but the heads don't bob even the 60s ones the heads don't they don't go up and down they're just fixed and they swivel and that's it but I think there's an evolution between stuff like this on your dashboard and bobbleheads on your dashboard and maybe if I knew more about bobbleheads, I could tell you more about that. But I thought that was interesting. I thought that was, there was some insight there about wh why these were made in the first place and why they look the way they look. What was the point? Uh, they were made for toy, uh, for kids. They were toys made for kids. But they were also made for adults to put on the dashboard. They were made for everybody. I don't know what these are made of. I assume PVC. I don't know how durable they are. And I don't know if you try to stick these to your dashboard. I don't know how that would work. I don't know if that would go over. Maybe, but I don't think people these days want to stick anything to their dashboard, particularly if it's a new car. They don't want to mess up their dashboard. But in the 60s, it was probably some kind of a hot rod, customized, and probably a, a backyard mechanic put it together. And hot rods are kind of part of, well, not kind of, they're part of Munster's lore. The Munster's coach, their main car, in the episode that has the, the uh, Marx Frankenstein that we talked about a few weeks ago, that same episode, Lily buys two different cars and has the mechanic shop put them together and build a custom car. And that becomes the Munster's coach. And in the movie Munster Go Home, Grandpa Munster, if I remember correctly, makes the Dragula. Now, I could be getting that wrong. The Dragula is in Munster Go Home. And I, th I think it was introduced in that movie. Am I wrong? Was it introduced on the show first? Maybe it was introduced on the show first, but I thought it was introduced in the film. And that Grandpa was the one that put it together, or... Or, or had it put together. I could be wrong about that. But definitely we have these two hot rod cars, the Munster's Coach and the, Dra the Dragula, Grandpa Munster's Dragula, that Herman drives in a race in Munster Go Home. So that culture is part of the Munsters, the hot rod dragster car culture. And because of the theme, the musical theme for the show, surf culture is also part of the Munsters. It was, it was part of the surf craze because it had a, a surf theme, the, the Munsters theme, that's surf music. So there's a lot that goes into this, but this is the Rob Zombie contemporary Munsters. And when it came out, earlier this year in the fall, it got a lot of hate. For a while, it was, it was overwhelming. The social, social media just blew up against the movie. It was the butt of a million jokes for a while before it came out. I think once it was out, I, I, I then, well, I know, then the criticism died down because a lot of people liked it. A lot of people watched it and said, hey, you know, this ain't too bad. And, and also, but uh, more than anything, I think people understood the context of the film. I think earlier people were, people got the idea that it was a $40 million theatrical feature film. And, and I thought that too. I, I didn't know better. I, I was like everybody else. I thought it was a $40 million theatrical film. And as time went on, the way it was being promoted did not feel like the way you promote a $40 million theatrical film. And I think that disconnect fueled a lot of the early criticism. People didn't know what to make of it. They didn't know how to respond to what they were seeing. There was a, something wasn't quite right. Something didn't fit. And I think it had been 
better promoted, I think that would have head off a lot of that criticism. I would blame the promotion. It, it was, I was going to say it was, it was poorly promoted early on, but I think it's not a qualitative thing. I think it's the type of promotion. It was the wrong approach. Well, I mean, I don't want to go too far into that, but I, I, once the once people knew more about the film and they knew it was produced for streaming and it was not a $40 million production, it had a very modest budget, and they started to get the context of the whole thing, what this production was and what it was trying to do, then I think they got it. Then I think it clicked. And then when the, they finally saw the movie, um, a lot of people, some people still didn't like it, but a lot of people were able to defend it and push back against some of the criticism. So I saw it, uh, I saw it on Amazon Prime. I, I don't remember, I think it was, was it Netflix? I, th I think it was on Netflix, right? Okay. It was on Netflix, but it was also on Amazon Prime, and now I don't know what your options are. It's on Blu-ray. You can buy it. You can buy the physical media, um, but I don't know. I'm sure now it's, there's a lot of other options if you want to see it, and just you know, Google it, and it'll be easy to see how, how you can watch this movie. But I saw it on Amazon Prime, and I liked it. It, it wasn't you know, a crowning achievement of cinema, but it, it wasn't trying to be. It was, it was actually, I thought, a sweet movie. It was a, a sweet, cute movie. It, I liked. It was kind of sentimental, um, and it was a, a, a nice uh, monster bash or monster mash. Uh, we we don't have classic monsters teaming up or fighting each other very much these days. Or when we do, it's something overblown and awful like like Van Helsing, that Hugh Jackman movie from several, like 20 years ago. Uh, occasionally we, we get something great like Penny Dreadful, the TV show, Penny, the Showtime TV show, Penny Dreadful. I love that show. That was great. So we get some good monster, I would call it monster bash. Monster mash is makes you think of the song, so I'll call it Monster, Monster Bash. We still get some good monster free-for-alls now and then, but it's very rare to have Frankenstein and Dracula and uh, the Wolfman and all these different classic monsters, universal monsters together in a movie. When, when have you seen that lately? I guess Van Helsing was the last time, and that was horrible because that was an overblown action movie. I you know, I hate that. This is this is a more modest film that seems like it was made with love. And so that goes a long way with with me. As, as long as I I don't feel like Van Helsing was made with love. I feel like Van Helsing was made with like give me the money. This I feel like is like it was a love letter to 60s monster culture. So I was willing to definitely meet it halfway. And I, I wrote a review on my Facebook page, my Facebook profile, the night I watched it. I wrote a review, and I think I'll, uh, I'll include that in the description because that says it much better than I'm saying it right now. That expressed my feelings much more effectively than what I'm doing right now. So if you want to know what I thought of the movie, just watch that, or um, read that in the description, and that sums up what I thought of the movie. But I liked it. Again, I don't want to oversell it. I don't want to say, it's fantastic. Oh, it's going to change your life. It's so great. No, no, no. But it's a fun movie. It's actually, I thought, a very sweet movie. It's a sweet, fun movie with classic monsters. So I, I liked that he went back to the, the, the basis of the characters that we have 
the Frankenstein monster, Count Dracula, the Wolfman, and uh, Uncle Gilbert is the creature from the Black Lagoon. He doesn't just look like the creature, he is the creature from the Black Lagoon. So on and so on. And uh, Grandpa Munster is never even called Grandpa because he's not a grandpa yet. <laughs> they, Herman and, and Lily don't have any kids yet. He's the Count. He's Count Dracula. And it's been very heartwarming to see Danny Roebuck online just exploding with joy over playing that character, getting to be Count Dracula in a Universal Studios motion picture. He's been on Cloud Nine for months and he's been expressing it in social media every day, <laughs> constantly. And it's been a hoot to see him so happy about that and and obviously that was a life milestone for him to, to get to play that character and i hope he gets to play it again i mean, i i want to see another rob zombie monsters movie with the same cast um i want to see the count become a grandpa i want to see what happens now that they have moved into their house on mockingbird lane and they're in the United States at the end. Of, by the end of the movie, they start off in Transylvania, and by the end, they're in, in Los Angeles at the end of the movie. So, okay, I want to see them now in that house in the United States. I want to see their kids born. I want to see a plot that's a little more like the stories that were on the TV show, and, and see how that plays out. So I, I, I hope they make another one and I hope we get to see the further adventures of these characters with with the same cast if they change the cast then pff, I don't care then uh, but as long as it's the same cast I want to see another story with this version of the monsters and I'm sure a lot of people out there are like <laughs> no thanks <laughs> one was more than enough Okay, fine. You know, you don't have to watch it. And, you know, there's a lot of contemporary pop culture that I just, I can't stand. In fact, probably most of it I can't stand. But this was something that I felt like it caused no harm. No one is going to say that, that it's the same continuity as the original series. It didn't retcon the original series and, and, and turn the characters into something they weren't. It's its own thing and its own universe. And it's that's fine. I had no problem with it. It, it, it wasn't like... Uh, it wasn't trying to subvert expectations and take something we love and deliberately spit on it and say, oh, you like this, do you? Well, how do you like that? And that, and that, which I feel like a, a lot of modern adaptions of legacy characters and storylines, it feels like they're made by people who despise the original films and shows and despise the people who like them. I don't know why studios spend millions of dollars to produce uh, that kind of negativity and then are surprised when they're met with, they're met with negativity. Well, of course they are. What did you expect? When you try to destroy something people love, they're going to be upset. But I don't think that's what happened here. I think that we have a a, a well-intentioned adaptation of something and you can have different opinions of whether you like it or don't like it, but I feel like it does no harm. If you don't like it, that's fine. You can set it aside and you can enjoy 
the monsters or any other there's been several versions of the monsters any other version of the monsters you can enjoy just fine you can take it or you can leave it and i really feel it's just it depends who's the motivation behind whoever is making it and if it's made with love it, it, i think at the very least will do no harm you might not like it but it, it does no harm when it's made with a feeling of superiority to the original or to the earlier versions or a feeling of contempt toward those earlier versions or contempt towards the people who are fans of those earlier versions, then it does do harm. It does harm to the art. It does harm to the culture. It does harm in many different ways. And we've seen the cultural results. We've seen fandoms torn apart. And I, I feel like some of that is not accidental. I feel like there's people who for some reason want to tear people apart want to divide people i don't know what that's all about but it can't be an accident some of the stuff is so calculated and the people who are making it are so smart they're not dumb enough to not know this is going to happen so it makes me wonder what what is going on and early on i feel like maybe some people thought this was tearing people apart because of the reaction i don't think that's what was going on i don't think that's what was intentioned i don't think and once it came out i think that all quieted down uh, i think people saw that like it or not it was made with love i think they saw that they may not even if they didn't like it or didn't think it was good it was well intentioned and when you feel that something's well-intentioned, I think that goes a long way. Sometimes people who say their intentions are good are lying. But not in this case. Okay, what else can I talk about? Well, have you got this yet? This has been out a few weeks, so it's not brand new. It's, it's been out for about a month or so. Um, I, it came out in November, and this is December now. But this is Brian Hyler's Toy Ventures. I guess officially it's a Plaid Stallions publication, but Brian Hyler puts it together. This is the latest issue. And if you don't have it, you might want to consider getting it. It does have something by me in it. Well, it has this lovely Telco Motion that's, oh, I would call it like a checklist. Telco Motion that's checklist. It has, it's a rundown of all the different large motion that's the telco made, but I didn't write that. That's not that's not my contribution, but it's it's something significant that people who watch this channel might want to see. But uh, I have something in here. Oh, there it is. Here's my contribution, this Incredible Melting Man article about the Collegeville Incredible Melting Man Halloween costume. That's my first formal, well, I guess it's my first byline in this magazine, but I've been involved since the first issue several several articles I, I've, I've had some the first issue was there was like a think tank of collectors uh, that were helping Brian with this Azrak Hamway monster I would call it an article but it was really most of the issue 
and uh, I was very much involved with that. And there was a Lincoln one that was very much involved in. And just over time, uh, I've been helping out as I can. But this is the first time I've actually formally written something and, and put my name on it. But the plan is that I would have a recurring column. So that what you just saw, that's a column. I would have a recurring column. And it is, so why did I, I lost it, there it is. And it is branded Basement of Horror, like the channel, like the, the show, the show you're watching right now. So that's the plan. We'll see how that goes. I would have a, a recurring uh, column. I don't know if it'll be every issue. Probably not, but it'll be, I would hope more often than not, I would have a, a column in the magazine. So if you haven't subscribed to it, that might be a reason why you would want to subscribe. If you like this show, you might want to subscribe and, and read that column. Or not. Not doing a hard sell here. But I thought that might be something you'd be interested in. Okay, I think that's enough. Is there anything else we can talk about? I don't think so. I think that's it. Well, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in all through the season so far. Uh, it's not over yet. We still have beyond the holidays into the, into the spring. We have uh, several more episodes to go. And I hope you're having a happy holiday season. Uh, and we might skip a week or two around Christmas time. I usually do, but I don't know exactly what the schedule is going to be. It kind of depends what I'm doing and if I have time to do an episode or if I have to skip a week. But historically, around Christmas time, there's a week or two, or December, January, that I, I don't have episodes. So don't worry if, if there's couple of weekends that you don't see me I'm not dead I'll be dead someday but uh, I might be dead I don't I hope not I hope not but if I'm dead you'll probably hear about it watch social media if anything happens to me that's where that's where you'll find out but most likely I won't be dead I'll just be taking a little holiday break but I think I think I'm gonna do one more episode at least before that so don't don't panic don't don't worry you'll see more of me that's it thank you very much until next time the one who dies with the most toys is dead mm -hmm.